this week to get back to my regularly scheduled, well, Yakuza Papers reviews. However, as of this recording, which is the last day of February, we had some good news related to the Where's the Fair Use post that I had earlier, and specifically some movement on the Google YouTube front. For those of you who haven't watched the video, and I'll put a link in the show notes and an annotation thingy up over here, card thing, you know, the usual Google doobly, YouTube doobly-doo stuff. Um, one of the suggestions I had for ways in which YouTube could be fixed and improved into something that doesn't quite, you know, suck, was the idea uh, that when somebody does a content ID claim on a video, that when the claim is appealed, rather than the person who made the claim just getting to take in money over the course of the appeals process and all of that, instead the money is held in escrow. And once any disputes have been resolved, then whoever wins, be it the person who made the claim in the case of an actual infringement, or the person who didn't make the claim, the, the, the person who made the video, they get paid. So, we're getting that. And that's awesome. But it's the first step. There's, there's more to go. We Google's also announced that they've increased the support team for YouTube for handling these claims. Also great. There's a few more steps to go. One of the things they've not talked about is dealing with bad actors, as far as penalizing bad actors. Now, this is actually even kind of bigger now that they have a larger support staff handling these things, and there is the escrow system, where you now have actually more incentive to appeal a content ID claim. And this is because one of the things I've encountered in the past is abuse in a extortive fashion from people making claims. So, if you've been following my channel for a while, you may remember a while back I did a Let's Play of Halo 3. And this happened actually around the time where the first big Let's Play Content ID Strike Fru Fra happened. Where Content ID Strike um, claim takedown notice all the whole shebang was happening. And I received a bunch of claims on my videos from the record label who was putting out the soundtrack of the games. Lots of other people having similar issues. Now, when I was appealing these claims and was winning, I received a email communication, not a direct email to my inbox, but a YouTube message system message from the company who was doing these claims informing me that if I continued and persisted in appealing these content ID claims, they'd be forced to take greater steps, including sending takedown notices, which could cost me my channel. At this time, I'd just recently been kicked off Blip, and consequently, I didn't want to lose this channel too, so I slacked off on the appeals, and in cases where I was able to mute the game audio to remove offending music, I was doing that. So that's what was happening there. and. With the escrow thing, this is now something that could quite possibly end up happening more often. Where, as an example, let's say, let's take Jim Sterling's um, copyright gridlock plan. Let's say, for example, this uh, it just happens to you. This isn't a deliberate thing you did. You were actually trying to monetize your videos to make money. And you get copyright strikes in your video. It's fair use. You're up to start appealing them and you're winning your appeals. You're getting the money from escrow. You, you, don't, you have a reason to do appeal these things because you're going to get the money back. It's not like you've lost the early first few weeks or, or month of the video's income, and consequently, you're, it's effectively not worth keeping the video monetized. But so you're, you're getting your money back. You're getting the money that you're owed. And your content, the content ID claimant says, hey, all right, I, you don't stop appealing. We're going to switch to takedown notices. 
As it stands now, there's nothing to actually stop them from doing this. There is no repercussions for doing this. And the thing is, you can do a continuity claim or a takedown. You can't do both. Obviously, but in those terms, you can't like switch to a uh, takedown notice after losing a content ID claim. At least that this is from my understand how the system works. I don't have that much inside baseball knowledge, and YouTube isn't that transparent in terms of how their regulatory system works. My concern is what will happen here is people's channel people start, people start losing their channels now, and basically instead of a more diplomatic way of resolving this, or just company going, okay, we'll just take our lumps and not get the money from these videos, that they may escalate. And my concern is, well, that's being a bad actor on their part. Is your they're screwing up the system for everyone. They're saying, okay, if we can't take people's money, then no one gets to make any money on here unless we approve of who the, these people are who are making money. Which sucks for YouTube and sucks for people like me and sucks like lots of other for other content creators. To my knowledge, this hasn't happened yet. But then again, I, in the case of the uh, Halo Three Let's Play, didn't call the company's bluff. Somebody's going to do that. Their channel's going to be taken. Channels may get taken down. And the question then becomes, and this is something I'd like some transparency on YouTube's part. What do they do here? Does this go through the normal? appeals process, or are there going to be additional steps taken here along the lines of, for example, this same company did several content ID claims against this uh, channel holder, all of which were overturned, and now they sent a takedown notice. Is this going to receive any sort of weight, or, are, or is there any process in place for YouTube to say, or Google to say, no, you can't do that. You have already demonstrated to be wrong on these points. You have shown a pattern of bad behavior. We will treat your claims with less weight or ignore them or ignore your takedown notices entirely. Now, this does, if they were to do this, open up YouTube and Google up to some liability concerns. YouTube has a, has a ton of money. Google has a ton of money. Theoretically, they could fight this. However, there is a history of legal precedent that sides with record labels and movie studios and the people who will be filing these claims in the first place. I bring this up as well, because this is an election season, and I get lots of email newsletters, I, I have no doubt that you do as well, from various causes wanting your attention. And one of the things I'd gotten was a bunch of reform the DMCA emails. And the thing is, with these reform the DMCA emails I was receiving, is I read them. I, oh, hey, this will be cool. This is some actual political movement on these things. But I started reading them, paying attention to them, and discovered something. I'm going to see if I can find one in my inbox. Can't, to quote, sadly I don't have one. I deleted it. Oh, well. And basically the gist of these emails was not that the exist not siding with the where's the fair use crowd but rather it's, it's basically astroturf counter messaging it's record labels using the likenesses of the celebrities that you are fans of the sim performers and artists that you're a fan of to push back against where's the fair use saying yes we need a reform of the digital millennium copyright act we need a reform of how youtube works to make things better for the record labels. And this has me legitimately concerned. It's one thing for just the things to be the struggle they are now, where the record labels have more money, more, lo more lawyers, more time to play whack-a-mole with people like me, or people like Brad Jones, the, the cinema snob, or Doug Walker, the um, nostalgia critic, or hell, um, James Rolfe, the angry video game nerd, to clobber us, and we just go through the content ID claims process over and over again, and we just get ground down. 
but we are able to still keep going. There's one thing to do with that. It's another thing for when we start trying to push back and start trying to get some reform to have people who have a lot bigger promotional budget to try and flip the script on us. So, I bring this up in a video that's probably going to come out a few a month after this announcement, or no, no, the three weeks after you, Google's announcement, because I want to keep this fresh in people's minds. Because in the United States, at least, it's an election year. And in lots of other countries, you're having elections as well. Or you have your members of parliament who you are probably sending out newsletters to you or that sort of thing. And last time, I did a call for action by discussing things that could be done to reform YouTube as a call for Google and YouTube to fix things. Now is a time for us to also speak up. Because now, this is something where it's not going to be an issue in the presidential election. And honestly, if we were to write Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton or John Kasich to ask them if they are elected president to do these things to change how, con to how change the GMCA works. They can do some political pressure for this, but this is a situation where the rank and file, your state, your representative, your senator from your state or your district to Washington are the people who will be doing the change here. So they're the people who you need to be communicating with. And... Basically, what you need to say is this. I'm not going to give you an exact script you need to say. But if they have a town hall meeting and you have a chance to talk, go there and, and talk, or just sending a telephone, making a telephone call, or sending an email or a letter to their office, what you want to say, not these exact words, you, use your own words, and honestly, you probably can phrase it better than I can, that you'd like to see the Digital Millennium Copyright Act reformed in a manner that makes things more equitable for the average user on YouTube. Explain that things as they stand are are biased in the favor of record labels, of studio executives, as opposed to the average user. And that the way the system is structured now, the way claims are handled, the way the DMCA works in terms of enforcement, is a system that is inherently designed where a person is guilty until proven innocent. When the, um, I don't want to say nostalgia, nostalgia chick because she's no longer using the handle, but when Lindsay, I forget her last name, Lindsay Ellis, my apologies, I will try to edit out this little bit of dead air. When Lindsay Ellis discussed where's the fair use. One of the things she brought up in her videos and on her blog posts is that fair use is a defense, not a... Maybe it's a defense. It's something you use after, they, after somebody comes after you with charges. But the difference being is... For any other criminal thing, for um, and piracy and copyright infringement are, in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the legal system, civil or criminal, it, it's crime. When somebody comes to take a case to court, when they do this, they have to put together an explanation of how of why the person did this. They have to pr have their proof that the person did a thing. Honestly, the way the things are structured now, and this is my complaint with with the DMCA, with the way the legal system handles copyright claims, copyright infringement, the lawsuit itself is generally considered proof of infringement. It's not a situation where if somebody takes files a claim against me. Uh, they they are the ones in for the big fight to prove that I inf that I infringed when I do a video about well, for example the, my video that was taken down my 
video of um, the uh, to- of the, the Tokyo Dome show. Uh, shoot, I forget the exact name of the event. It fell on my head. But, or if somebody's in the takedown claim against one of my video, uh, my film reviews, the ones where I particularly try to keep clips down to under 15 mi- seconds in length when the average for fair use is 30 seconds. If someone's in the takedown notice against one of my my, my review of Quaidan, my review of the Yakuza Papers films, the fight, the, per- the person who has to have the, the long, drawn-out fight is more likely to be me than the people filing the claim, because all I think is, as far as the legal system is structured and how the DMCA is structured, is they use, he used clips from this work, therefore is infringing copyright. What should be happening, and the way this should work, if the system was structured well, and this is kind of what you need to get across to your elected representative, or your representative who's running for election, or your representative or potential representative who's running in a primary, if you haven't had your primaries yet, is the way the system should be structured is when somebody files a takedown claim, when somebody files a DMCA claim, when somebody files a copyright infringement lawsuit against a YouTube video producer, the way the claim should be written it should be basically, oh, he used cl- his clips were over 30 seconds per clip. There was no discussion of the work in question. There was no parody of the work in question, that sort of thing. And they have to prove that something is not parody, which if you understand how parody works, that's something that's very hard to do. If you're doing a, or review, if someone's doing review or criticism, proving something is not criticism should be something that is hard to do. So, these DMCA claims against people like me, against people like the Nostalgia Critic, or the Cinema Snob, or the Angry Video Game Nerd, the AVGN doesn't usually get those claims as much, those should be hard to fill. The claims against guys like Jim Sterling should be hard to fill, should be hard to prove that this is infringement for a content ID claim or a takedown notice because of, for example, editing. And good editing combined with commentary. For video review video reviews and let's plays, I'm not an internet lawyer. I don't mean in terms of a person who is a lawyer on the internet. Okay, I'm not. I'm neither a lawyer on the internet nor, nor am I a lawyer who is an expert on the internet. That one is something where someone else is going to have to go through the process of getting the burden of proof. But still, there's that. So that's the thing that that I guess people should be talking about now. And I hope that in the future, after you've watched this video you will go write your congressman, be it representative, senator, whatever, and talk to them about this, particularly if you, really with the election coming up. Uh, this is an issue that's important to you. It's not an issue that's going to make it in the advertising campaigns. No one's going to put on their platform when they're giving a stump speech or when they're giving a television advertisement that we're going to fight, that he's going to fight to reform fair use, reform the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, so that the average voter is going to copyright strikes against them. But it's still something worth bringing up. And they listen. They pay attention to things like this. One of my senators from my state is Ron Wyden. I should know. He's pushed lots of strong internet reform stuff. He's backed legislation to strengthen net neutrality. Wyden's one of the good ones, the really good ones. When it comes to internet policy law, bringing up to your representative that something that matters to you will mean something more, particularly if they are, if you are their constituent, than if I say this online and you just, and just you send a video of this to your senator if you're not in Oregon. So, with enough of that rambling out of the way, thank you very much for watching. Next time we will return at last to the Yakuza papers to the next two episodes, and then we'll continue with Nintendo Power Retrospectives. Thank you once again. See you next time.
Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you mentioned in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everyone. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.